Okay, so uh, um, I believe we are now uh, live for this uh, fifth uh, Agnive uh, session. So for those who know me, don't know me, I'm Sylvia Worth, and I'm very honored to be a part of the uh, Agnive organizers. Um, so let me introduce myself. I have uh, briefly, uh, I have been uh, studying navigation using uh, uh, virtual reality in the non-human primate, and I'm very happy today to host a session in which uh, researchers have been studying navigation in uh, freely moving animals, including human. And uh, for one of our speakers, I actually uh, managed to study navigation in the field as well as through uh, virtual reality. So this session takes an ethological and neurological approach to study uh, how the brain integrates multiple senses to navigate and maintain uh, direction. And our first speaker is an ethologist who captures navigation behavior of bats in the wild, mixing uh, highly accurate tracking systems and modeling to study how the animals learn to navigate. Uh, the second speaker is also an ethologist who uh, combines studies in the field and uh, virtual reality technology to study how different species of non-human primates have a mental representation of the world. And then we go back to uh, uh, the laboratory to learn whether and how the hippocampus neurons in the marmoset uh, represent uh, uh, space in uh, uh, freely moving animals. And uh, although the method is quite standard in the rodent, only a few teams uh, have done this in the non-human primates. Um, so it's really great to see that, that uh, the non-human primates community is catching up on these technologies. And uh, finally, our last uh, speaker studies how the vestibular system in human contributes to the sense of uh, direction and spatial orientation during uh, natural movement. And uh, the common denominator, of course, being that the vestibular system is engaged during whole body motion during natural uh, navigation. So uh, now, uh, Yossi can take the stage, and I'll just close this, and you can share your screen. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sylvia, and I want to thank all of the organizers for the meeting. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. I can't see you, Sylvia, so if you want to say something, just tell me. Uh, so, I think in the past few years, we reached a strange situation in which we know much more about how the brain encodes space than about how animals actually use space, in, specifically in the wild. And the reason for this is that most experiments are performed in laboratories in small scale that does not represent the animal's real behavior uh, outdoors. So you're probably asking yourself, um, and what does it mean? I mean, we have a lot of knowledge about how animals move. We put GPS devices on them. We know that the Arctic Tern navigates across 20,000 kilometers every year, but we actually know very little about the mechanisms underlying this navigation. How does it do so? Which sensory modalities does it use and which, uh, navi which navigation strategies? So why is it so difficult to study animal navigation in the wild? Here's an example. Uh, we develop our own miniature GPS devices. You can see an example here. We place them on bats. And here's an example of a fruit bat that we tracked over, this is in Israel, over almost 100 nights. And you can see that the animal moves quite far. It first moves to point A for something like 10 to 20 nights, and then it moves to point B, and then it moves to point C. And let's assume that um, I want to know if this animal is using some kind of a cognitive map like uh, in navigation. So suddenly I'm looking for shortcuts, right? And suddenly I see this shortcut, right? The animal is performing a shortcut between point B and point C. So can I say that the animal is using a cognitive map? Uh, the problem is, that I don't know the history of this animal. So this animal bats can live up to 30, 40 years. I don't know if this is the first time that the animal performs the shortcut. Perhaps it did it many times before. Perhaps the first time it did it, it was following another individual. Perhaps it moved in a random uh, uh, search when it did this in the first time. So without knowing the history of the animal, it is very difficult at least to study cognitive maps, uh, if not to study uh, many other navigation uh, strategies. So in my lab, we decided that, uh, uh, first of all, we focus on studying animals in the natural environment uh, in, in large real life scale. And second, we decided that we want to overcome this problem of not knowing the animal's history. So in order to do this, we came up with the following idea. We established an, our own colony. So you can see it here. This is our colony in Tel Aviv University. We introduced bats to the colony and uh, happily or 
uh, we were happy to see that uh, many of them adopted the colony as their mother colony, as their house, and uh, started the foraging and coming back. You can see here an example of one individual uh, a few nights after we opened uh, the colony and allowed the bats to leave. And uh, each night is depicted by a different, different color. And what I like about this example is that you can see that already on night two, the bat finds a neighboring colony. It sleeps over at friends, if you wish, and then comes back uh, to our colony. Similarly, we have bats arriving from different colonies in the environment and uh, making our colony a home for them. So our colony is now part, is assembled in the network of colonies in uh, the environment. So now uh, we have the full, we can actually acquire the full history of uh, the animal from birth and to adulthood without missing a single moment in its life. Before showing you a movie that depicts such, a, such, a, uh, such data, I just want to thank uh, the students who collected the most of the data that I'm going uh, to present today, Lee Houghton, uh, Aya Goldstein, two PhD students, and Amitai Katz, an MSc uh, student. So here's the movie. It's one individual tracked along 60 uh, nights, more or less. Uh, you can see the colors of the movement of the day, sorry, moving from blue to red. So blue is early, red is late. And uh, this is everything the animal did. So when it arrives here for the first time, I know it has never been uh, around. Uh, and I see that it can come back. So now I can start analyzing this data, as I said, from birth to adulthood until several months when these bats are considered juveniles or sub-adults uh, and see whether they can perform um, a map li like navigation or in general follow the ontogeny of their uh, navigation. What you see here is just how the animals increase over time their home range and distance from the uh, from the colony, uh, as you would expect. Uh, and what I want to show here, and is important for, for our study, is that these are fruit bats. And therefore, they tend to return to the same fruit tree. So each individual knows several dozens of trees at every season, and they tend to return to the same trees night after night. These are something like 1,000 trees uh, used by our 20-something bats during the study period. Uh, and, and this is very important when you want to study navigation, because if you're working on an animal that uh, uh, searches for, for ephemeral food, it is very hard to define the target of the animal. In our case, we could uh, at least hypothesize that the animal is aiming towards a tree that it already knew uh, before, or that it was returning back to the colony, which is somewhere over here in the center. So to make a, a long uh, story short or shortcut, uh, do the animals perform shortcuts? Yes, indeed they do. Here's an example. I'll show you several examples. Uh, so how do I know that this is a novel shortcut? In white, you can see everything the animal did before performing the shortcut. The shortcut is in blue. In, uh, uh, in this uh, pinkish color, you can see what the animal did on the night of the shortcut before performing this, uh, uh, this uh, shortcut, okay? And uh, here are a few more examples of shortcuts. We've detected something like 100, uh, slightly over 100 shortcuts, which means that every bat performs a shortcut every uh, eight or to nine days uh, on average. We also defined another type, and these are, as I said, all novel shortcuts. So the, the animal never moved in a similar trajectory uh, before. And we also detected what we called long cuts, which I think in the past were hard to define because you never had the history of the animal. Uh, a long cut is similar to a shortcut, only that it occurs outside the home range of the animal. So this is the home range, everything the animal did before this uh, night that we're tracking here in green. And then you can see it moved far out of its home range. Sometimes this can be dozens of kilometers outside the home range. And it's still, uh, uh, after foraging, new to come back straight to a tree a familiar tree or to the colony. So in this case, it's similar to a shortcut, but uh, the animal is navigating through a completely unfamiliar uh, environment. And here are examples for uh, uh, of out of the 120 long cuts that we uh, uh, detected. So let's characterize these shortcuts and long cuts. Uh, they are very straight. Okay, what I'm showing you here is the straightest in the straightness index. Uh, one is of course uh, completely straight. This is, these are commutes. This is the distribution of commute. Commute means moving on a familiar trajectory. You can see that shortcuts are almost as uh, straight as commutes. Long cuts are also very straight, a little bit less straight than uh, shortcuts, but quite straight. And both of them are significantly and dramatically different than exploration, uh, modes in which the animal is moving towards an unknown location, or in comparison to any model of a, a correlated random walking that we uh, try to uh, uh, to develop. Uh, I would also I should also say that we uh, excluded other types of uh, navigation strategies. I, I will not go into all of the controls that we performed, but for example, we see, uh, I, I personally find it very difficult to believe that an animal can move 20 kilometers, turn and turn and turn, and then uh, come back 
using path integration, but in case somebody thinks this is possible. So for example, we run a control in which we show that there is no correlation whatsoever between how much the animal turned or moved, not in distance or in turning, and the accuracy, the straightest index of uh, the shortcut uh, or long cut that was then uh, performed. Uh, both shortcuts and long cuts start at moment of takeoff. Takeoff, sorry, they are directed towards the target. Okay, so you see the distribution of takeoff angles, and they're both in shortcuts and long cuts uh, um, um, centered centered around the, the direction of the target. Uh, I can also say that we found the correlation between the takeoff speed and the distance to the target. Okay, so it seems as if the animals they clearly know the azimuth of the target. It seems as if they also have some kind of assessment of uh, the distance to the target. And uh, one of the immediate questions that comes to mind is uh, from which age bats can perform these shortcuts? The answer is from day one. Okay, so from day one here, you can see the number of shortcuts, the, the probability of performing a shortcut uh, along days. You see that it doesn't change over time. What changes over time is the distance. So of course, when you know more, when you've mapped more of the environment, you can perform longer shortcuts and longer uh, long cuts. But you are able to do this from day one. I should say day one is actually day 40, day 60 is the first day when the, the animal leaves the cave. It's not the first day in its, uh, in its life. The next thing that we addressed, and I'll be very brief about this, is what is the sensory modality allowing the bats to perform this cognitive-based uh, navigation? And we uh, argue that it is probably vision. It might surprise you, but these bats see very well, um, especially these bats, but most bats uh, see well. Some of them see very well. And we have several points of evidence suggesting that this is the case. I'll just mention a few of them. We see a correlation between the uh, altitude. So before returning to the uh, to the tree or to the colony, before performing a shortcut or a long cut, the bats will often ascend. Uh, and you can see a correlation between the distance of the long cut or shortcut in blue and black and the altitude that they ascend to. And you can see that they're not going up to thousands of meters. They're going up to less than 100 meters. Okay. Why should they go up to such low uh, elevations, the answer is that we see a clear correlation between the height of the buildings where they are. So this is all urban navigation. Maybe I should have uh, emphasized this. So they only go high enough in order to see, that's our interpretation, of course, beyond the buildings. Okay, And once you go, and we actually image this with a drone, uh, I'll just show you one example. Once you go above the building, you suddenly see this urban horizon with a lot of very salient urban landmarks, which allow uh, to detect the azimuth of uh, uh, the colony in this case or any other goal. We actually tested this on humans that know the region and we showed that they can use such images in order to, in order to point towards the colony uh, direct, uh, directly. Uh, of course, we excluded other types of uh, sensory modalities. I'm not going to all evidence, but for example, olfaction could be a key uh, sensory modalities for these bats. And we show, for example, that there is no correlation between the straightest index, between how good you navigate, and between a, a wind, whether it is upwind or downwind. And if they were using olfaction, you would expect to see some correlation. The next thing I want to uh, talk about is the individual differences. So we saw ten immense minutes. differences. You have 10 minutes left. Thank you. So we saw immense differences between individuals in terms of uh, their exploration. OK, what you see here are uh, just the bats sorted according to their uh, home range. And you see different individuals. This is all on the same day. You can see here's three examples. On day 70, if I'm not mistaken, you can see coral, which is a very non-exploratory individual always staying around the colony versus uh, nature that is an individual that explores uh, a lot. So we thought, okay, we see this variability. Let's see, our prediction is that if they are mapping the environment, there should be some correlation between uh, their, explore, ex their tendency to explore and their ability to navigate. So what we did is we performed a, a translocation experiment in which we moved the bats to locations where they have, they have never been before. We know for sure they have never been there because we uh, because we uh, know their history. And you can see here nature, which was a very exploratory bat, mo is moved to the center of the town. We have two locations, the center of town, very salient locations, and the coast over here. And you can see it comes back home in an almost direct uh, trajectory. And on the other hand, coral, that was a very non-exploratory bat, uh, was translocated to the sea, which is an extremely, to the beach, is extremely salient landmark. And still it performs this crazy trajectory flying far out at sea, and then coming back and somehow managing to come back to the colony, we'll go back to how it does so uh, later on. Uh, in these translocation experiments, we saw no correlation between the straightness of return, so the uh, quality of navigation, and the proximity, how close bats were to the translocation um, location before. So th this means that if the bat was close to the place where we released it, it didn't mean that it navigated home 
uh, better, which would be expected, for example, if they're using some kind of a reference matching uh, strategy. And on the other hand, we did see a strong correlation between how exploratory these bats were and how good was their uh, navigation. So once again, supporting this mapping uh, hypothesis. Going back to Coral, if we plot the elevation uh, of the animal over the trajectory, you can see that what happens is that the animal was slowly ascending as it was flying, drifting uh, into sea. Uh, and then at this point, my interpretation, it suddenly sees there's a cliff over here. It suddenly turns around, sees the city behind it, and comes back uh, and somehow manages to find the way back uh, to the colony. So to sum up this part, what we think that is going on is that the animals are using some kind of a visual triangulation system or, or something like that strategy in order to triangulate the direction to uh, and the distance to some extent to uh, um, locations within or outside their home range. So in this case, it's a what we define as a shortcut within the home range. In this case, it's a long cut. And notice that when the animal, and we had many occasions like this, so in green, you see the, um, the home range, and then the animal suddenly finds itself uh, on the south to this huge ridge of uh, buildings. So if you think of the visual input, everything is reversed for the animal, right? And the distances, the, uh, the angular distances change, and still the animal manages to find its way uh, straight back to the colony or the tree in this case, uh, suggesting that it has some kind of a cognitive map-like re representation. I'm not going into uh, details on how accurate this map is. I just want to say that obviously the bats are not always using the using map-based navigation. I would say most of the time they are not, as we probably do. Okay, when they need to use a shortcut or a long cut, they they can do it. But often we saw them, for example, flying along the highway. So I think when they can use simpler strategies, they would do so. And I think one of the most interesting next steps is to try to understand how they switch between navigation uh, strategies. In the last minute that I have, I'll just tell you briefly about another story we're working on these days. So these bats are actually carried, the pups, you can see it here, are carried by their mothers during the first months of their life, something that we deprive them for, from because we place the pups without the mothers. And we were wondering what is the role of the mothers in, uh, in the acquisition of these navigation capabilities. And what we find is a very interesting behavior which is de depicted in this schematic. So you can see that the animal flies with the pup outside of the cave, it leaves the pup, so the animal, the, the mother is in green, the pup is in orange. It leaves the pup on what we call a drop of tree and then flies to forage, sometimes very far, comes back, picks the, the, the pup up at the end of the night and brings it back into the cave. And what we find is that once the pups start uh, flying independently, something like three weeks later, they will first, here you can see the pup flying alone, they will, and without the mother, the mother is not here, you can see her trajectory for comparison, the pup will fly along the same trajectory more or less to the same um, drop of trees and later on will increase its exploration moving uh, to new uh, territories. I will just end by saying that using accelerometers, you can see here the acceleration of the mother and the acceleration of the pup, we can show that during these flights, the pup is actually carried on the mother. So uh, if, and it's actually upside down. So if the pups are indeed learning to navigate during these flights, they're doing so while being carried on their mothers and uh, actually carried upside down. That's it. I want to thank a lot of uh, students who uh, uh, and, and funding agencies and collaborators who actually allowed me to uh, collect all of this data and to present it uh, to you today. Thank you very much. I'm done. Okay, great. That was really uh, fascinating. So the uh, uh, last uh, uh, thing is actually alleviate some of the questions that people had, which is that uh, the bats first learn to explore carried by their mothers, but then expand uh, from there on their own. So let me just, is that right? Yeah, So I mean, that's, that's the, the current hypothesis we're working with. Yeah. So I'm just gonna read the questions here, which is one, uh, is there one successful shortcut every eight, nine days? And what is the proportion of failed shortcuts? Can you identify mm. what would be a failed shortcut? It's a, a very good question. How do you uh, define, you know, it's always trying to get to, to the animal's uh, brain and interpret it. How do you define a, a failed shortcut? I don't have an answer for this. I, I should say that, you know, we could, uh, uh, so we didn't define the shortcuts according to their uh, straightness. We define shortcuts according to their movement between two uh, uh, known locations in, an, in a new novel trajectory, and then we measure their status. We could, for example, um, ranks uh, shortcuts according to their straightness 
and uh, perhaps look at, uh, at the least straight uh, shortcuts and non-cuts and try to understand what went wrong. That's an interesting idea. And uh, maybe we we'll cor correlate that with exploration, with previous uh, exploration. So, so that's, a, that's an interesting idea, but we haven't done this. Yeah, I guess this is related to another question, which was, can you distinguish whether shortcuts are based on path integration or cognitive maps? Yeah, I mean, maybe there are some events. I, I cannot exclude that some events. I, I, so shortcuts can be up to 20 kilometers long, and they, they can occur after hours sometimes. Okay, So the animal is moved for hours, uh, in long cuts especially, in, in unfamiliar territories, and then it, you know, it, it goes straight back to a familiar location. Uh, in those cases, I would say uh, path integration is very unlikely, in my opinion. And we've done several controls, such as looking at uh, uh, whether there's a correlation with how, how much the animal turned. You know, in path integration, you expect that if the animal turned more, it will be less accurate. We didn't see anything like this. I cannot exclude, of course, that in a very, uh, in some of the simple uh, uh, cases where the animal moved uh, uh, maybe hundreds of meters and then performed the shortcut, uh, could be related to path integration. If somebody has an idea how to uh, determine between the two uh, hypotheses, I'll be glad to hear. Okay, so one of the question was uh, um, whether how the animals exploit their home range. So did the bats systematically visit the trees, or was it random across nights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good question. It's uh, it's quite random, I would say. There's nothing systematic that I can uh, um, uh, point to. But uh, what we often see is that the animal will, let's say, explore, find a tree, okay? And find another tree, find another tree, and then instead of going, uh, cutting straight back to the colony, it will go back along the route, the original route that it created at, at first. And then it will do this for a few nights, and then at some point, there's probably a aha moment uh, where the, the brain realizes, okay, I can now do this instead of going back the long way. And this is something we, we haven't quantified, but we see it uh, again and again. But uh, uh, is there any incentive for them to change the route in like resource exploitation? Do they have to change because you there's... Mean, ah, you, mean, you mean why not to return to the same trees yeah. again and again? Yeah, yeah okay. So that, that's, that's a, a very interesting question related and unrelated to navigation. So I, first of all, the, the, the trees, the, the fruit, the, the uh, provided the uh, um, food that is available, is changing constantly, okay? So, uh, you know, if, for example, they eat figs, ficuses, they will be ripe for a month and then another tree will be ripe. So they're constantly moving between exploration and exploitation. We actually see that the pups explore more than the uh, adults. And the way I see it, they're constantly maintaining, let's say, some kind of a repository of available fruit, but also monitoring new possibilities, okay? We also see this with colonies. And if you think of an urban environment where they are, everything is changing even more quickly, right? Because today the tree is available, tomorrow somebody removes it or removes the fruit, actually. This occurs a lot with dates, for example. So this is, uh, I think they're constantly weighing exploration and exploitation. And if you saw the, the first trajectory, you could see that they sometimes move they move a lot very close. It's hard to see in the movie because it's uh, occluded by the rest. And sometimes they perform these very long exploratory trajectories. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, more questions. And this is frustrating that we cannot keep uh, the conversation. But uh, I think uh, we have to move on. Uh, so thank you very much. It was really great. Uh, so we'll now have Francine Dolins, who's uh, going to tell us about uh, how non-human primates, uh, including apes, I think, uh, you are able to use virtual reality tools and how this actually enables us to understand how they uh, represent space. So, uh, um, Francine, we're ready for you. Hello, Francine. Hi, how are you? So I'll just try to share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Um, I'll use this one. Let me know if you can see it. Not yet. Does that work? No, not yet. No, okay, hold on. Let's try this again. It says, oh, share. Okay, hold on. There. Let's try that. Does that work? Yeah, it's coming up. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Hold on. My slide shows just starting. There we go. Okay. Yeah, great. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak and to all of the organizers for organizing this really fascinating symposium. I've been enjoying it so much and learning so much from the previous speakers um, and applying all sorts of ideas to the studies that I'm doing and want to do and understanding my data better. So thank you. 
Um, the title of my talk is Primates Navigating a Virtual Space, and I will talk about that um, uh, as I go along. But I first want to talk a little bit about um, what happens when primates navigate in the wild. And so they face various challenges that have to do with their physical and social environment, and that has to do with the size and density of the environment and the availability of landmarks, um, the inter and intra-species competition um, for um, food and the quality, quantity, and also the seasonal availability, in other words, the temporality of food, and also avoiding predators. And then, of course, um, the impact of humans. And that's um, um, probably a much more recent thing that we've been that they've been experiencing. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently in that what kind of adaptations, cognitive adaptations do wild primates and other animals too have to make in order to survive in this age of the Anthropocene when there's habitat loss, fragmentation, depopulation um, due to hunting, fires, and so on. Um, and so I'm specifically sort of thinking about what, what kind of ecological challenges um, in it with the within this Anthropocene are shaping wild primate populations behaviors and especially their spatial cognition and I'll partially address this question but not really um, it's something that's a huge question that I think you know everybody needs to think about in terms of wild animals and navigation so we have technology that assists us in, in evaluating navigation and Yossi gave such a nice talk before um, that you know it, it covers some of these issues, um, but you can see up in one picture here, uh, there's a picture of Tico of Bonobo, who I work with. Um, he's using touchscreen VR technology and desktop VR. Um, scientists are using GP handheld GPSs or GPS collars to track navigating um, animals. We have satellite images. Um, we're using AI agents and machine learning for comparison to develop generations, uh, uh, comparisons of uh, behavior, cognition, and modeling. Um, when we talk about GPS data, it allows us to have this much more accurate movement data. Um, now, I'm talking not like you'll see flying, but in terms of um, terrestrial animals, which can be very rugged environments. And so it allows us to have these sort of sophisticated modeling tools to incorporate landscape features of movement and um, uh, to in to analyze primate memory of their landscape and their route choice. Um, and that taken together with satellite imagery, we can create these predictive habitat modeling and then combine that with um, observations on the ground. And we can understand a great deal about the spatial cognition and navigation that wild primates are using. So for instance, my, a study by my colleague, uh, Gina Hickey, um, where she uses GPS data um, from wild bonobos to look at their sensitivity to human presence in a forest. And she looks at their ranging behavior and their distribution. And um, what she was able to do was come up with systematic measurements of bonobo ranging behavior in relation to specifically human proximity and encroachment in the forest. So what she found was that the bonobos would distance themselves from agriculture, from any forest edges, especially where humans were encroaching in the forest, and that they would avoid um, any activity in the forest that had humans just even walking through and making a machete cut on a tree. And so what this means is that while the bonobos had a large, physically, you know, a large home range, they actually were parsing their forest into sections of humans have been here, humans have been here and here, will avoid those sections. And maybe for days, weeks, and even for months, if humans had come back regu regularly to those areas. So this is a relatively sophisticated way of looking at um, their environment. Um, and when we look at humans um, traveling, for instance, in a study in Rwanda using GPS data, um, Green et al. were looking at not just could they develop straight line travel, were they efficient, how did they get to the food sources, but actually what was the energy landscape like? In other words, how, how energy um, uh, draining how much energy expenditure did they need to use to get around this landscape? And did they try to reduce this energy expenditure? So what they found was that the chimpanzees were preferentially using human-made trails, which, used, which allowed them to use a lot less energy um, rather than going along the ridge tops or creating their own trails, um, which would have been perhaps more of a straight line travel. 
um, and that they what they did was they reused these human roots and they incorporated them into their own network within their home range, which is really, I think, very interesting. In a um, study that Paul Garber and I did in the Amazon um, rainforest in, in uh, Peru, we were following um, caught, uh, mustache tamarins in the forest and we divided up their forest into 30 meter, 30 meter hectare, uh, quadrats and we followed them around and we mapped their travel routes in these quadrats. And what we found was that over a hundred of the quadrats, they just did straight line travel. But in seven of them, and only seven, they had these directional changes. So they had, they had a 90 degree turn or greater. And what we found was that these were areas like, you know, like if you think of um, a Grand Central Station in New York subway, or if you had a bus system where you had one place where you changed buses, that these were places where they would change direction by distance and, and angle. Um, and Dick Byrne um, later took this on it and um, developed the change point test where determining um, the direction at which an animal's travel path orients towards a specific location, which is out of sight. And he and his PhD student, Rahel Moser, asked the question, were Chakma baboons directional changes associated with important resources and specific landmarks? And what they found was that these direction uh, changes of direction were near specific landmarks and that they were divided into either going into direct straight line travel to another direction, um, towards fruiting trees or towards um, going towards eating dry matter like dry leaves. And so these were specific kinds of um, points in their forest like nodes um, that, that they were using to change direction and go towards specific locations that they had intended to apparently. Um, so, um, so the question is whether or not these are topological maps or are they actually sort of Euclidean maps? You know, and cognitive maps, as people call them. And so there's some slight evidence with chimpanzees that potentially there are, that, that apes can use Euclidean maps. Um, so Carly and John Mott's study looking at prospective spatial memory in terms of ripening fruit and planning to get to those fruiting trees um, when the <clears throat> fruit is in its optimal ripened state. Um, Norman Dunbash did a study, um, observational study with chimpanzees in Thai forest um, where they suggest that their apes are using Euclidean maps, using straight line travel and accurate directionality towards a goal. And then um, again, back to Green's study, another uh, paper that where they examined the least cost model versus the straight line model in terms of the chimpanzee travel in these very rugged landscapes. And what they found was that the chimpanzees were using these least cost routes based on the physical, physicality of the landscape, the ruggedness of the landscape. So it was as straight line as they could get it, but really incorporating the least amount of energy expenditure. So that to me suggests some evidence for Euclidean maps. It's not very definitive, but maybe some hints towards it. But the um, most definitive that I can find is um, an experimental study done in, um, with Kanzi, who is a bonobo, who is lexigram proficient. And this was done with, by my colleague, Carly, uh, uh, Charlie Menzel, um, using uh, lexigrams. He asked Kanzi to navigate to various locations in the forest around the lab. And Kanzi had been taken out to this forest many times for picnics, as you can see in this picture, and he would go for walks with people. And so what they asked Kanzi to do is to go to these various locations that had been identified by lexigrams, um, but not use the trails. And then Kanzi was able to do these straight line paths, these shortcuts to these locations in the forest, not using the trails. And so this suggests that he, had an, he has an accurate internal representation of this forest, and he was able to recall it when he needed it to apply it to this navigation. So then I get to the point, well, why use virtual reality when we can do these studies in the wild? Um, and that's because they're very difficult and there aren't many um, apes like Kanzi where you can just talk to them and say, hey, can you go to this location and show them a lexigram and have them navigate there? It's very challenging to, to study spatial cognition in the wild. Um, and virtual reality offers these many advantages to understanding the wild primate spatial knowledge. It also enables us to have these cross species, cross age groups, and cross cultural um, comparisons. And it affords us this great flexibility um, 
in presenting the environments and what kind of landmarks and the space and the size and the scale and the quantity and quality of food availability. The movement is generated by the participant. Um, it virtual reality and provides enhanced ecological validity for captive studies. Um, it integrates both lab and field work. It allows for these direct comparisons with across these multiple species, but also entities. So we could also include AI agents in this. And the richness of the virtual reality world seems to enhance rapid learning compared to many abstracted problems that are presented in the lab. So um, just a have summary, five minutes left, Francine. Just a summary of this, you know, so we can do these cross-species, cross-discipline, and cross-cultural comparisons. Um, so in the virtual reality testing environments that I've used so far, um, we have both built and naturalistic. Um, and just I'll quickly go through built in uh, one study that we did with a built environment where we presented um, open space um, with one barrier, two barriers, and goals hidden behind it, one of them, and then one, two, three, and two T mazes, and then complex mazes. And you can see here just a few examples of two of the chimpanzees' travel behavior in one barrier and two barrier environments. And in this next slide um, on the left-hand side, you'll see um, two chimpanzees, again, pansy and mercury, compared to adults um, and children um, navigation in their first trial in a 2T maze. And in this case, the chimpanzees are doing slightly better. Um, so if you just look to the far right, um, the average shortest path ratio across all the environments um, for um, the different participants, so pansy and kanzi, the chimpanzee and bonobo, um, they did better than the younger children, but on average, they didn't do as well as the adult humans. Um, but if you look at specifically, for instance, the complex maze, studies, um, Pansy and Kanzi did much better than the humans. In fact, the young children couldn't do this task at all. So there was some very interesting um, things that came out of this. So um, in, in summary of this particular study um, in VR, the human path lengths parallel that of the chimpanzees and the bonobos um, in the more complex environments the path lengths were generally longer for everybody and especially longer for the younger children. And this is interesting. I, a recent study um, published by my colleague, uh, Carlene Janmad, um, where they looked at humans, the Mbenjali hunter-gatherers in Congo and chimpanzees um, in Ivory Coast rainforest. They found that the human and chimp foragers showed similar straight line travel patterns to out of sight locations. Um, but when you impose the, when you analyze the data in terms of the familiarity with the area, the humans had um, increased linearity in familiar areas, while the chimps it had um, increased linearity in less familiar areas. And then when you look at it through group size, the travel linearity increases for humans. Um, but when the group size is larger, the chimp um, group size decreases. Um, sorry, linearity decreases for, for increased group size. So here um, uh, you'll see, hopefully, um, if it will work. Uh, there we go. Um, this is a demo of um, the environment that we're going to start an experiment in, in the naturalistic environment, so you can see what it looks like. Um, we call this the Bonanza Fruit Trail Shortcut Study. Um, and in this case, the it's an avatar walking on two feet, they will not be there walking on two feet, um, that they're moving towards fruit trees. And as they get closer, hopefully you can hear there's bird sound in the background. I'm just increasing the, the sound. Um, and as they get closer, they can hear the bird sound. So they have both visual and auditory cues. Um, uh, and in this, so in this experiment using the very naturalistic environment, we are testing humans um, in Benjale and Bantu and Congo and, and people in the United States, and then a whole series of primates, um, apes, and monkeys, and also using AI agents for comparison. Um, the questions that we're addressing have to do with equivalence, um, representation, and whether or not internal representations can be used in both virtual and real spaces similarly. Um, and then we're looking at the experience of language and what, what, what effect that has on spatial cognition. So here, um, you'll see um, two uh, orangutans who are in training to learn using the virtual reality environments for the first couple trials. And as they touch the fruit, they get handed a piece of fruit. And they learn this task very, very rapidly. Um, here on the left, you see Kanzi um, doing a shortcut task. And on the right, you see Alex. And in this particular experiment, um, they were 
given a cache of fruit under one tree where they had to learn that direct that cache of fruit from different <coughs> angles and directions and distances and then once they learned that the cache of fruit was moved to a new location and then this is them trying to find the new cache of fruit using a shortcut and they're both successful in doing this um, in this um, film clip you'll see this is a study by my colleague Kari Janma um, so here she's in the forest with um, a Membenjale child and she has shown this child where there are five locations of food hidden and using inefficient roots she's shown them where this food is located and then she's taken the child back mm -hmm. to the beginning and she said now find the food and the child uses an efficient route in other words a shortcut and in this um, slide you'll see um, two film clips one on the left a Membenjale boy and the right a Bantu girl both doing the exact same shortcut task that Kanzi and Alex were doing that you saw on the previous slide and that the um, Bantu girl was doing in reality in a sense. So, and they're both successful um, in getting to the shortcut. Um, so we analyze our data by looking at the linearity and using optimal and actual path ratio. And we also are analyzing the data in terms of the learning strategies that are developed in comparison to AI models. So here you'll see, for instance, how our data is generated. Um, so we have a shortcut, um, sorry, the um, optimal path, which is the black dotted line, and then the actual paths, which are all the colored lines for um, one particular day over three trials for one chimpanzee, and then the Alex. And then if you see um, on the far left, um, there's Alex's data for um, this particular study. Um, so he has very good linearity. In other words, there's not much deviation from the optimal path, but you can see there's deviation in the other chimpanzee data. Um, so there's variation in individuals. Um, so we can also compare using AI analyses and we can develop these learning strategies and take individuals um, and use their data um, and run it through and see which model um, were they using to learn from and did they shift those models as time went on. Um, so there is some suggestions of equivalence from virtual reality to real life. Um, so that we have recorded food grunts and handshakes when the apes see food on the screen, virtual food on the screen. And um, they also attempt to grab fruit. They will peer around and try to bite things on the screen. So this next slide I'll show you. Um, on the left is Tico. He is doing a virtual bunny hunt. And he eventually bites the screen and grabs at things. And on the right, you see Alex, who is looking for food in the shortcut task and the food is behind this tree and he is trying to peer around the tree to see it better. Okay, Francine, we're going to have to, uh, yeah, okay. good. And so just in summary, um, using virtual reality, the apes appear to learn the locations of foods, those locations in relation to landmarks, and they will travel to out of sight locations, they show observable signs of equivalence, and they learn the tasks very fast. Um, just our future studies, we're looking at intentional cooperation and knowledge transfer using multiplayer games between chimpanzees and bonobos, um, and in terms of hunt, hunting virtual animals. Um, so we're introducing primate avatars, um, and we're introducing social partners based on reputations of helping. Um, and just quickly, I'll show you um, on the right, you see Kanti is doing a virtual hunt um, and on the left is a demo of an avatar. It's a gorilla. We're still looking for a very good chimpanzee um, avatar, but they can hunt and um, uh, these individuals. Okay. So I'd like to thank you for listening and to acknowledge my co-PIs on this project. Thank you, Francine. So uh, I just had a question. So there's generally this uh, uh, idea that uh, apes or monkeys are sort of proximal to uh, uh, children uh, in, in space. And there's the uh, uh, results that, for example, children and like uh, human adults cannot use uh, geometry to reorient themselves. Uh, is this something that you could study uh, using virtual reality? Yes, I think so. Um, if I've understand the, understood the question correctly, you're the, asking So children and, and adult human have different ways to uh, uh, reorient themselves. For example, children are not that good at using landmarks and they use uh, spatial geometry. So is that something, so would, where would the uh, um, chimpanzees and other monkeys 
be and is that something you could study with virtual reality? Yes, we could because we could change the environment and we can introduce um, geometric features. We can change those geometric features and change the scale of that in, in virtual reality. Because you can make it huge, you can make it small, you can change those, you know. So we, we have geometric features in that. And so yes, I think we can create geometry in terms of um, the shape of the environment as well using geometric features and landmarks. Um, there's a question, somebody asking whether, it, uh, saying that chimpanzees are extremely clever animals, why is the usage of Euclidean maps still under a question? Does it mean that these maps are too difficult or too easy for them? Um, I think it's because we just can't gather the evidence. It's very difficult to do. It's not that we don't think that they have it. We just don't think that we, we can't find it. We can't measure it. That's a difficult right. Um, do you use teleportation in virtual reality? Oops, yeah. Uh, in the non-human primate, just curious if they can be trained to use this feature. And if so, how this influences navigation? So we have not tried to teleport them around the virtual environments. Um, we have that in mind to do some things like that, but it also would confuse them. So we, um, it's, we only have a few apes to use in our testing, and so we don't want to frustrate them or confuse them when we're using the virtual reality. So, so we, we develop things um, as naturally as possible, and potentially when they get very used to the systems, we could do something like that, but initially we wouldn't do that. Yeah, it was striking in your videos that some of the monkeys were actually confused. I mean, had like a confusion between the reality and the virtual reality. Uh, is that something that is uh, dependent on the experience they have? Or because usually when you show them picture, they learn that it's not real. Whereas here you had the animal that was licking the screen or you know, reacting as if everything is, is real. So do you think that they... Uh, uh, perceive the virtuality space as real? I think they're, they tend to suspend belief, disbelief, I suppose, that's the word, um, and see those objects as something that, that could be real. And so it, it makes using virtual reality and testing them even better. But someone like Kanzi, who's used touch screens for a long time, um, he, he tends not to um, show those kinds of behaviors, but yeah, we'll have to see how that goes as time goes on, um, because this is only in the first you know, couple of years of doing this. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Francine. We'll hear about it next time, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. I'm going to have uh, our next speaker. So uh, here we have a strange visual effect, but uh, this is Corey Miller. Um, Corey is trying to share his slides, but he's going to tell us about the uh, way space is represented in the hippocampus in the long so set. I can't hear anything. Are you able oh. to hear me? Yes. Yes, I we can't hear you. Hear anything. Everybody's going to answer in the chat, but we hear Once you. they brought me into the back room, um, I couldn't hear the, all the audio got shut off. So, um, you know, yeah. So, so no, OK, so maybe you can the backstage team can just uh, uh, take you off stage and bring you back. Okay. So thank you for hanging there. It's going to restart soon there. Is that better? Okay. Can you hear so us now? I still can't hear. I could hear just a moment ago, but now it's off again. Um, okay, my suggestion is uh, maybe... I'm already, um, I'm already here. Could you please reload the page and I invite you again? Yeah, everybody says thank you for uh, posting on the chat. So he knows at least that we hear him. But I think that's not enough. He'll need some feedback.
I guess I guess the other possibility if it's uh, possible is to invite the next speaker and then maybe we can just swap with the speakers. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you for waiting. Up to now, everything was going on pretty smoothly. So uh, it's one of the first glitches. Okay, we decided to uh, switch speakers. So in a few minutes, hopefully, or a few, like in less than a minute, we'll be uh, able to hear Barry Simongol. Okay, there. Thank you so much for saving <laughs> session. Uh, okay, I haven't saved it yet. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. So far, we can hear. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Good. Um, so I have to hover. Yeah, hover uh, yes, above. We, mm -hmm. uh, window. I think I will select window. So Does that work? That's perfect. Okay, I, I actually and have you to could, make it. You could put it in uh, full mode. Okay, so... Uh, um, full presentation, yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm actually doing something illegal. I realized um, I'm using Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> so you could hear that it actually works with Firefox. Is that we I mean? didn't. Really, I forgot that okay. it didn't work with Firefox. Okay. Um, do you want me to go? Yes. So you can just hit the presentation mode, full mode for your. I, I am in presentation mode. Maybe I. No, I mean in the the diaporama, in slideshow. Sorry, this is French. Slideshow. Mode. Yeah. So maybe I just need to to switch then to. Um, Let me close that. One moment. So okay, so uh yeah, it's almost yeah, we can, but I think Thomas posted that the slideshow doesn't work in Firefox. So oh, yeah. maybe you try to cheat, but uh, I didn't mean to cheat. It was you just, will have um, to switch to Chrome. So if I do that, what can you see? Well, we can see, you know, the side of your slides, which mm. is not optimal, but uh, oh. okay. Uh, that means I'll have to log out. Um, I could do it like this just to save time. Um, there are lots of people waiting. Okay, I think that's. What shall we do? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's fine. We can just go ahead like this. Let me just. 
Yes, everybody says yes. So uh, okay. No, okay. Everyone says yes. Fine. Sorry about that. I I don't use. Chrome. And you can just reduce the slides on the left. Thank you for all the tip in the chat window. <laughs> okay. Yes, you can. Fine. That's it. Yeah. If you... Okay. Great. Perfect. All right. So pseudo presentation. Okay. Uh, let me uh, make sure I. Uh... Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, really, thanks. Uh, for inviting me to talk to this um, meeting. Uh, it's a shame we didn't end up in Italy, uh, but anyway, here we are. Um, and it's been an interesting year for everyone. Um, I'm at home today, but I'm quite often in surgical scrubs on the wards because I'm a neurologist dealing with patients. Okay, so um, I'd first like to say thank you to the team who are responsible for most of the data I'll present and of course, thank you very much for the funders who support the work we do. Uh, then the, the first thing I have to say is that um, uh, all of the patients in, in the talk, all the data that I'll present, are patients with normal peripheral vestibular function. Um, and as you all know, um, uh, the uh, peripheral vestibular organ is sensitive to uh, inertial head movements, um, in particular head acceleration. And the information uh, is inputted into the central nervous system and is ramified quite extensively, both to high order centers and low order centers, mediating um, uh, perceptual outputs, but also reflex outputs. So if we consider uh, reflexes such as vestibular reflex, which we can examine as a, as a, a neurologist, and vestibular spinal reflexes, again, which we can examine, and so patients with uh, a stimulation of the vestibular system uh, will will manifest <clears throat> a nystagmus vestibular reflex, which we can see, and will also manifest an imbalance again, which we can measure. But then patients also complain of self motion perception, which uh, can be considered as vertigo, um, uh, and we can ask patients about that. And there are tools that we can use to measure uh, self motion perception. We, uh, we also know that humans can orientate in space uh, using cues of vestibular input only, uh, mainly in your plane uh, rotations in the dark. So um, in terms of uh, uh, vertigo, the question patients, are you feeling that you're moving? Um, uh, so we previously published um, uh, white matter correlates of duration of vertigo in healthy subjects in the uh, in 2015. And then in 2016, uh, we published uh, acute focal stroke patient study looking at spatial orientation on the vestibular control. And I will briefly touch on that later on. Okay, fine. So uh, the role of vestibular cues of self motion perception, spatial orientation is uh, uh, is is the basic premise be behind uh, today's talk, really? So uh, the idea is that uh, self motion perception, the manifestation of this, is an indicator of the presence of motion signals at higher cortical level. And the question is, are, are those signals used uh, for uh, orientating in space by humans? Um, and so, at one level, if you have rotated uh, by a certain amount you can ask yourself in the dark, how far have I moved? And then if you want to reference that to landmarks, you can ask yourself, where am I with respect to some other uh, external landmark? And of course, in the dark, uh, that would have to be a remembered landmark. And of course, it, ecologically, one is doing this whilst walking, locomotion. Um, and if anyone wants to look at an interesting paper that was published quite a few years ago by uh, Stefan Glassauer, working with Alain Bertos, uh, they looked at the contribution of uh, vestibular input into triangular task walking. And since then, many people have looked at that task as a way of probing uh, vestibular contribution to orientating space when locomoting. And the key finding is that when walking in a straight line, a joint angle and somatosensory input is sufficient to update position in space. But when rotating in, in to the right or left, uh, peripheral vestibular input is required for that. So um, 
In terms of simplifying the situation for balance control, because uh, we are interested in uh, how uh, we're under situations of spatial orientation, um, the balance control is affected. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to stick to postural control, which is the simplest uh, uh, type of balance, as opposed to walking, running, or even jumping. So ecologically, uh, orientating in space when locomoting is important for things like foraging for food, which is a classic um, uh, paradigm used for, for animals. Uh, but in humans, uh, there is a clinical relevance to orientating in space whilst walking, because if you consider a uh, gait or balance as a task, and uh, artificially you consider spatial orientation as a separate task, then you can consider the, the, a purposeful walking as a dual task. And we know patients with neurological disease under dual task conditions like walking and talking uh, increase risk of falls. So the summary of the research approach is that we assess a uh, patient's self-motion perception and I'll briefly touch, show you how we do that. We look at uh, vestibular orientation uh, performance um, in terms of how far have I traveled uh, and where am I in my environment, so how that is uh, it, um, linked to landmarks, and also postural control. So how do we do that? Um, so as I mentioned, for rotating on the bottom left of your screen, you'll see we, we look at self motion perception in a passive way on a rotating chair with an algorithm uh, uh, that is automated in, in the dark. We do uh, vestibular orientation again with a rotating chair, computer control, either complete in the dark using techniques such as joystick control of the chair to uh, return to start following a stimulus or uh, with uh, virtual reality on the rotating chair so that uh, patients or healthy subjects rotate within a learned simple environment and then have to indicate using VR, virtual reality, where they think they have rotated to. We measure posturography with, with, with standard uh, techniques, which measures sway. And in the bottom right, you'll see the posturography uh, setup. And the important uh, condition is the last one, the, the one on the furthest right, which is standing on a soft uh, platform, a soft um, foam on top of a, a force platform with the eyes shut. And in this situation, you do not have visual input. You don't have or much attenuated a joint angle position sense, and therefore you're predominantly vestibular dependent. And then finally, we do brain imaging in these patients, both structural and functional imaging, primarily resting state, to make correlations between behavior, uh, structure, and brain function. So in, talk structure, the, the, in terms of talk structure, I will first talk about uh, results that I impress uh, in acute traumatic brain injury, and then I will touch on some initial pilot data in patients with memory disorders. So um, the paper that's in Press and Brain uh, is uh, um, a credit to the team. Uh, this is a study that we, we assessed uh, about 1,000 patients were screened, examined 150 in acute major trauma ward, and uh, recruited um, just under 40 patients. Um, and required acute testing, follow-up testing. So really mammoth tasks, well done to the team. So one of the things, as I mentioned, we do in these patients, we measure uh, vestibular perceptual thresholds because actually in the, in the ward, um, these, about a third of the patients have manifest uh, loss of vestibular perception. So what do I mean by that? Is that um, these patients have easily treatable inner ear disorders on the ward, and these patients will have what appears to be a, 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 a profound or very strong uh, vestibular reflex res response that can see with the nystagmus and the patients do not complain of vertigo. They are free of vertigo, which sounds a good thing, but not necessarily because in fact, the patients are very unbalanced. So if you look at the bottom uh, on the left-hand panels, you see um, uh, in terms of degrees per second, we measure thresholds, higher is bad, lower is good, in terms of vestibular ocular uh, thresholds, you can see the controls are equivalent to the patients, but the perceptual uh, thresholds are much elevated in the patients. In the middle panel, we have the results of the sway, and <clears throat> you need to concentrate on the, the three, uh, the, the final uh, sway condition on the right-hand side of your screen of the sway, 
And you can see in the vestibular dependent sway condition, the patients who, who have elevated vestibular perceptual thresholds, which we call vestibular agnosia because they have the intact peripheral dis, uh, function and they have manifest vestibular activation, but they are not perceiving vertigo. These patients have much worse sway. And the final panel on the right-hand side, you can see that acutely patients with vestibular agnosia uh, have worse sway. Sway is shown on, in the y-axis. And over time, the x-axis, at three months, uh, many patients, the sway improves back close to normal. The normal range is in the uh, olive green bar. So um, uh, in terms of brain imaging, so we did initially structural brain imaging. That's what's in press. Um, and so there are four panels there. Perhaps we can concentrate on panel D, which is of the, of the bottom left. And what we find in those traumatic brain injury patients who are unbalanced, and we find that uh, in the uh, in the bottom, in the temporal lobe, you can see a, a patch which is yellow, uh, that those are voxels that are correlated with the measures of vestibular perception. So we find that in the uh, uh, inferior longitudinal fasciculus, in the, in the right temporal lobe, uh, those voxels are the abnormalities in those voxels are correlated with vestibular agnosia, but only in those patients that are unbalanced, therefore linking that area of the brain to a combination of imbalance and loss of vestibular perception in those patients with traumatic brain injury. So you have five minutes left. Okay. So I, I, I in terms of uh, parts of the brain that are re related to vestibular perception, I would suggest you uh, look at a paper in 2003 by uh, Kahan et al, uh, Vestibular Stimulation of Brain uh, areas. Okay, so uh, we've also uh, got some uh, work uh, in progress using resting state, which is a, 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 an approach that looks at brain networks. Um, and our provisional analysis has found that comparing patients with and without vestibular agnosia, there are differences in the right superior lobule, but also in regions more inferiorly, also in the right uh, temporal parietal areas, and, but also interestingly bilateral frontal cortices. Um, again, you, these are, uh, this is work in process uh, with using um, independent component analysis. Again, we find uh, abnormalities when comparing vestibular agnosia and non-vestibular agnosia patients focused in the right hemisphere, again showing a clustering in the right hemisphere. So the summary of the provisional functional imaging data is that vestibular agnosia seems to be linked with ab uh, differences in function in between the, these two patient groups in the right superior lobule, right temporal parietal and bilateral frontal networks, but the real picture is probably more extensive networks. And uh, those who are interested, um, uh, we published in the middle panel a paper on this in um, healthy subjects, but also again, the Kahan et al paper is useful to look at. And Eddie Wright's published a very interesting paper in rodents about this. Uh, and we're also doing tractography because, um, again, this is in process looking at subcortical pathways uh, using our previous uh, work in cerebellar pathways uh, to look at the neural correlates of vestibular agnosia. Um, and just to touch on uh, spatial orientation, I will skip through the um, stroke data that we previously published. If anyone's interested, you could look it up showing that temporal parietal junction is linked to vestibular disorientation, uh, but not to vestibular agnosia. Um, and finally, to, this is work in progress in patients with dementia. We find that patients with Alzheimer's disease do have a uh, vestibular agnosia. That's not previously been reported. And that degree of vestibular agnosia is, in, is linked to vestibular disorientation on the simple um, uh, vestibular task, which requires reproducing distance with a joystick. Um, but we find actually that when we compare sub healthy subjects with dementia patients, the performances are quite comparable. When we look at a virtual reality uh, task combined with actual real rotations, we find that the, the Alzheimer's patients with worse dementia actually now show a much worse uh, performance. And but how, however, that seems to be linked with vestibular agnosia. So. Uh, we finally, we find that imbalance is also linked to uh, worse dementia scores, and we also know it's linked to vestibular agnosia. So finally, uh, vestibular agnosia seems to be linked to impaired balance, spatial navigation, dysfunction, neurological patients, 
Alzheimer's patients seem to be able to transduce raw vestibular signals, but they're impaired in the ability to bind these landmarks. And the contribution of this uh, dysfunction in navigation by vestibular agnosia remains to be elucidated. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So I think I've got, uh, my timer says 15 minutes. Yeah, that's fine. So we have time for a few questions. And uh, Laure von der Reig is asking one, which is uh, hinted to be about the cerebellum, which you talked a bit about. Uh, any idea which region network manages the dual task, dual task gate balance versus oh. navigation? Uh, no idea. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any work that, that uh, can answer that just at the moment. Uh, so we, in a previous study, we looked at the differences between uh, two healthy control, uh, two healthy groups um, who only differed in previous exposure to um, uh, rotations. So ballet dancers with rowers, all female, right-handed, uh, average age 23 and similar educational background. And a whole brain analysis showed a difference between the two groups in the vestibular cerebellum. Um, that was a very simple paper looking at the duration of vertigo following a, a rotation response. Um, and so we were simply trying to elucidate those uh, differences in the brain with response to adapting to ro repeated rotations. I can't answer that question. Um, with respect to the traumatic brain injury patients, we haven't done any additional studies because each session in the laboratory for the patients took three hours. Um, and that's a, a tough task for someone with an acute uh, injury. If anyone has an answer to that question, uh, please uh, message me because I'd like to know about that work. Uh, okay, and Jean Laurent asks, uh, we would expect that balance depends more on spinal slash cerebellar networks. Uh, do you think that imbalance really involves the vestibular cortex? Could TBI also affect the cerebellum? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's very interesting. Um, in patients with acute traumatic brain injury, and I have seen about six or 700 now over the last uh, six, seven years since I start, started being interested in TBI. Uh, one does see acute uh, cerebellar dysfunction in TBI patients, but almost always, interestingly, the patients with manifest contusions in the cerebellum. In fact, uh, patients with acute traumatic brain injury clinically manifest something called a vestibular ataxia, which is what you see in acute peripheral vestibular dysfunction, but we see that in patients with preserved peripheral dysfunction. Uh, importantly, about 15 to 20 percent of patients with acute traumatic brain injury do have impaired peripheral function, and in our study we specifically excluded those patients. We only included those with, with uh, in preserved vestibular function. So yes, the cerebellum is involved in balance control, but interestingly, in, in a blunt head trauma, um, uh, cerebellar ataxia is uncommon, and if it's it's present without a contusion, then one suspects some other problem, like a pre-existing cerebral dysfunction or drugs uh, or alcoholism. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're gonna stop here okay. because we're a bit late. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So, Corey, I trust you're here now. So let's try yeah. that again. <laughs> can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you this time. Okay, um, great. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. I was on the uh, wrong browser. So, um... okay. So we Is see your good? slides. That's okay. fine. Great. great. All right. Well, um, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, but thanks to Sylvia and um, the rest of the committee for inviting me to talk to you all a little bit about some of the things that we're doing in marmosets. Um, so the kind of broader ambition of this project in my lab is is not just about spatial navigation. So it's more about how primates navigate social space, um, which involves this sort of intersection between where animals are in the world and where they are in the social hierarchy and other facets of their sociality. And that intersection is this kind of question of who is where, right? Navigating social and, and physical space. So we're working on both parts of that um, independently with uh, a, a plan very shortly to be able to intersect those. Um, so today I'll just focus on the spatial navigation part of this um, and give you kind of a very brief overview of 
some of the things we've done, um, where we're at, and more how we're thinking about these things, and, and kind of what's on deck next. Um, so uh, a lot of like a lot of the projects in my lab, um, we work on uh, the marmosets uh, in the wild. So marmosets are this small New World monkey that are found in um, northeastern Brazil. Um, there are a bunch of different marmoset species. So these are common marmosets. They're the most frequently used uh, species in laboratory research. Um, so our field site is outside Recife. Um, and what I'm showing here is actually a GPS tracking of an individual animal um, over two weeks. Um, so although there are boreal monkeys, um, they don't use the forest ubiquitously, right? So you can see these very clear trails um, that they, they like to navigate through their forests. Um, and the the thing we were actually supposed to do um, at the end of March was go down with a whole bunch of GPS collars to put them on animals, um, but obviously that didn't happen. Um, and so, but you know, the kinds of questions and data that uh, Yossi was talking about at the start of the session are definitely in line with what our intentions are here to really understand how marmosets are doing this, how they're linking space with resources and their feeding trees and so forth. So uh, I, I hopefully we'll be able to get back to Brazil um, in not too long uh, and get these experiments going. Um, in the lab, we've been focused on um, this question of how does hippocampus represent space, um, similar to what a lot of the, the work that's been done in rodents and bats more recently. Um, so we have one paper that we published on this that I'll just kind of briefly summarize um, for anyone who hasn't seen this. So our initial idea for this um, was just to ask whether or not marmosets even have the sort of canonical classic play cells. Um, so our, our thought was, let's just run a monkey on a rat experiment. Um, so we had them doing this L track that you can see in the upper left here. Um, and what we found, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that like every other mammal that's been tested, marmosets have neurons in hippocampus that encode self-position in space. Um, so we saw in the top row here, these are neurons that were right selective. So when the animal moved through the right of the maze, there are some that were left selective, which is in the middle row. And then there were neurons that showed a sort of bi-directional sensitivity um, where they would encode position both left and right. Um, so these, you know, roughly were similar to what individuals had seen in, in rodents before. Um, the other part of this is looking at, um, of course, the theta oscillations. Um, so we found that theta was not continuous. Um, so this occurred in bats. So this is similar to what had been reported in head restrained macaques um, from a number of people previously. So even though these animals were freely moving and running back and forth on this track, um, we still saw theta occurring as a bout um, in these marmoset monkeys. Um, there are also some differences in what seem to be happening in this context for theta um, relative to what um, more has been more commonly seen in rodents. Um, so we didn't really see much effect on locomotor activity uh, impacting theta oscillations. So we did high velocity and low velocity. That's what the LV and HV are here. We looked at a lot of different um, dimensions of theta here, but we didn't actually see the locomotor speed really modulating any aspect of that. Um, we also saw more limited spike field interactions. Um, so I'm showing a couple of the exemplars of neurons down below here that show phase show phase procession. Um, but the you know really of the, the number it was just you know really small number of neurons that we saw um, that actually had this kind of interaction as an other spike field um, analyses that we did. So you know this there's still a lot to be done here. You know I think they're you know, one of the things we had a very kind of broad approach to recording for our hippocampus in the marmoset, and we definitely need to go back and look at how the different subfields are contributing to this um, and, you know, doing that more precisely. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what goes on, you know, as we move forward with this. Um, but when we, you know, one of the things we really want to do for marmosets is take advantage of the fact that they're a small animal that we can record wirelessly um, as they navigate through space. Uh, so the next sort of build up from the, the track experiment was to really take advantage of that 3D environment. Um, so we built uh, an arena where we had these manipulatable 3D structures um, that the animal could run around. And what I'm showing on the right here is a video um, that is uh, a wireless recording in hippocampus um, using a, a video tracking system where we can project not only where the animal is in space, but where their gaze is directed or their head direction. Um, so you might not be able to see this on the screen, but I think it's the red line is its gaze position. Um, 
And there are a lot of things that were really interesting about this. Um, so if you just plot uh, firing rate activity in these 3D environments, um, you know, certainly what you see are these sort of play cells. Um, so what's being plotted here is firing rate by position in space on a certain track um, for a 3D environment that we built. Uh, and so you can see there's sort of this one cluster where you get a lot of firing there. Um, but there, the bigger problem here for, that we found was that this wasn't really encapsulating what we needed. So from this system, we could get head direction. And that's sort of a crude estimate of where the eyes are. Um, but we had parallel experiments that I'll talk about very briefly um, that were going on to make us think that this wasn't quite enough for what we wanted to get at. Um, that just having head position, really, we might be able to get some sort of rough estimate of spatial V cells, um, but that's not really the deeper question. The other is that what is you're not able to see in this video is that for the most part, what the monkeys did, if you put them in a 3D environment like this, is they would go to the highest point and like a good monkey, they would just sit there and look around, right? So they didn't really move, even if you had food, that you know, we had some sort of food dispensers that would go down and get the food and then they would just sit back there. So the vast majority of the time, what they did is they sat at the top and they just visually explored. And this, I think, speaks to spatial navigation more broadly in, in a lot of mammals that this idea that um, navigation, the act of movement through space and exploration of that space need not necessarily be coupled together. Right. So for animals that rely on very distal cues that are highly visual and highly auditory like primates are, we get a lot of information about the world around us and we can explore that world without ever actually having to move through it. And mostly what we see with the with the marmosets um, is that what they do in all environments is they explore it, you know, they look around and they map that in some on some level before they ever actually move through that environment. Um, and so what we really want to know is how do these two uh, processes actually integrate, right? If you can represent the world through vision um, and audition, because we have auditory data on this too, that um, is a little too 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 raw for uh, prime time yet. Um, but how does that couple with how we are representing space when we actively move through it? So the sort of you know exploration and and sort of classic self position place cells. Um, it's been a really a, a lot of really elegant work on visual representations of space, um, you know, roles and the spatial V cells that he's worked on, um, Beth Buffalo and others have done grid cells. There's lots of really cool VR um, experiments that, that many macaque labs have done. Uh, but, but our take on this was to try to um, focus a little bit more on what the eyes were doing, more in line with the, the Buffalo studies and really understand this part um, first. So what we arrived at was five, the spatial... Five minutes left. Five minutes? Okay, sure. So we, we arrived at this face foraging task. So this is essentially, um, if you just put up pictures, the marmosets will look pretty well, but they just don't saccade around a lot. So we have this task where we can put up all these faces so they can be in a grid, they can be scattered around. Marmosets love faces, so they will look at faces all day when we train them. Actually, this is almost as good as giving them a food report. Um, and in this task, what they have to do is look at the different faces and then when they look at it, they just get a little reward. So it's not motivating them to go to a certain spot, but just to get them caught around. Um, so this video will give you a, a kind of rough idea of this. When they look at it, it disappears. Um, and you know, we do this a, whole, a, bunch, of, a bunch of times in different spatial patterns. Um, to just get them to look around the screen a lot. Um, and then we can track those movements and so forth. So when you do this, um, what you get are spatial representations um, in these neurons purely through vision and, and eye movements. Um, they're not quite the spatial view cells, so you sort of loosely been calling them visual play cells. Um, some of them have very fine positions in space um, for where they're representing. Others, we also see these sort of border-like uh, activity. Um, so, but the the, this is probably not, um, given what we already know that they can represent space is, is, is you know, consistent with what we've seen before. Um, the things that have become interesting to us is how theta contrasts in this context with other ones. Um, so like during the, the locomotor activity, you know, theta is being captured here in red. Uh, so in different um, times, you can see there, there, it's still occurring in about. Um, one of the things that we noticed is that the about duration is about 7,800 milliseconds um, when they're just visually exploring. Um, but if you contrast this with when they're actually moving around, so when they're in the first experiment, uh, 
uh, when they're going through the track, um, what you see is that the the duration of these bouts actually is substantially shorter in that environment in that context than when they're looking around. Um, the other thing that we noticed was a change in the actual frequency of theta. So when the animals are moving around, um, what you see is a sort of a peak at around you know six to eight hertz uh, in in all the experiments that we did. Um, when they're just looking in the head fixed position, the theta frequency actually goes up to about 12 to 16 hertz. Now, interestingly, and this is sort of why we think we need the head and the eyes, if you just untether the animal's head and let them look around, so you're not head fixed, they're just head free, theta drops back down into the range as if they're freely moving. Um, so this is very curious to us and, and kind of brings up a lot of questions about what are the behavioral processes for exploration, for vision in a primate, right? That head and eye may not be telling us the same, the head direction and eye direction may not be telling us the same thing. And we know that these are, are roughly correlated, but eyes and head will move slightly differently. And, and, and you know, they're, they're definitely separable um, covariant processes, but we need to be able to measure them separately to really get at these questions. Um, so just to kind of summarize quickly here, you know, a lot of uh, we're the, the core driving question and a project that we have with um, Ketchen Zhang at Johns Hopkins is really uh, what are the computational mechanisms for bridging this representation of space through visual exploration as well as self-position of where you are. And theta is clearly playing an important role in this, I mean, or would seem to be at least from the Brennan literature. So how is that, why is that changing just based on whether or not the head is fixed and the eyes are moving or their head is moving around? Um, and there are a lot of really good questions for this, but the key thing that's really We've been we've sort of been working on for months now is is coming up with a way to actually be able to he measure head position and eye position um, independently in a freely moving marmoset. And so we've come up with um, where we now have a prototype that we just finished last week um, that got kind of slowed because of of COVID, obviously. Um, so a collaboration with Alex Huck and Jude Mitchell and Chris Neal. We've taken Chris's um, design from what he uses for freely moving mice, um, although those aren't a tether, and we've repackaged that into um, a wireless system so that now we can measure where the eyes are independent of head direction in these marmosets. Um, so that'll be the next step, uh, and that's what we're really excited about. Um, and you know, so hopefully, if this meeting happens again once we can all travel, uh, we'll have some, an update on that very, very shortly. Um, and so, just lastly, I just wanted to highlight the students that have done all this work. Um, so, Christos Corellis uh, and Sam Numelid led all of the, the initial play cell work, and now Mike Metke um, has been leading. He's a graduate student who's, who's finishing up in my lab. He's been leading the the visual representations of space with some help from a postdoc in my lab, Vikram Paul Singh. Um, so thank you very much, um, and happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much. It would be really been a shame if we uh, hadn't been able to see this. Uh, so I'm just uh, moving to the questions here. So uh, uh, beautiful data, I agree. Um, I'm wondering if you analyze punitive uh, interneurons in the hippocampus and uh, were they theta rhythmic? Yeah, so so in the in the initial study, we we hadn't we didn't have a large enough sample, or we we had putative interneurons, um, but it was it, I think we just didn't have enough. So in this new data set of so the visual one, and this is part of why we've sort of lagged behind in the data analysis. It's from eight animals, so we have thousands and thousands of neurons from the anterior to posterior hippocampus, from all this all the subfields. It's a massive data set, so I think now we'll actually have the capacity to look at that in greater detail. So when we looked at it in our in the place cell study in that data set, we didn't really see we 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 saw theta on the inner neurons, but I, I don't know. Which I, I'm not I'm not convinced of of which way that will go until we have bigger data set. So it's it maybe just say um, to be decided uh, to have more definitive answer. Okay, uh, just a question about their locomotion. So they actually seem to be running only by little bouts. Would that be an issue in that they, they, uh, you don't have enough sustained locomotion to analyze data? Um, so it, 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 it shouldn't be a problem. So in, in the, and this is part of, so the, the 3D environment, this was an issue, it's kind of small for them. So it's kind yeah. of bouncing. So we now have, as we're building an arena that's about uh, five meters by 
almost three meters by two meters, two and a half meters tall. So we have this giant space where we can really have these long okay. branches in there where they can move along. So on the floor, when they were moving, you know, the, the track of the arm yeah. was was pretty long. And there they would just run. They kind of sit and then they 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 run across it, right? So they don't bound in that way. So that bounding is more of a, an arboreal process and I think as we open up that space um, to allow them to really navigate through long distances we would it shouldn't be an issue okay um, I have a question from Nora Newcomb can you say more about why you selected this species specifically and what other species might be interesting um, one that moves around more in the wild well, I so, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think it's um I, again so I think I think you know really we should not just be studying like four species right if we really want to understand these issues we need to have a great diversity of taxonomic um, representation rather than just macaques and marmosets and you know rats and mice and then you know a few fruit bats uh you know we need a much bigger uh, um phylogenetic representation right that that's that's real comparative neurobiology um but for 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 us, so in the wild, they move a lot, right? It, it's not a matter of moving. I think what it is is that in the environments when we put them in, in their novel, um, you know, and I, I've worked with like a half a dozen different species of primates, and they all kind of do this, right? You put them into a novel environment, and they just they sit back and and they look. I mean, Reese's macaques are particularly angry all the time, so they might be a little bit different. But for the rest of the primates, and like Marma said, like most primates are a little neophobic. You know, they want to take in what's happening around them. Um, so once they get over that, you know, still then they're like, well, why would I? Why would I move? It's only you know a meter or so, and in a big space would be different. So we 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 have. Um, sort of a, a foraging forest that um, we're creating in this new arena that I think will motivate them to explore a little bit more. Um, but, um, and and where and the size of this and the way that we can include space, they won't be able to sit in any one position and just sort of scope things out. They'll have to move through it to be able right. to understand. So, so I think part of it is just getting the behavioral motivation together um, to get them to explore. Hmm. Uh, a question from Anne-Lise Paradis, but I think you can't answer that question until you have uh, a real eye movement uh, measurements. What's their relationship between theta frequency and saccade speed or number of saccades per minute? Parallel so that, yeah, so that, I mean, part of that is that the theta rhythm is too slow for a single saccade, right? The saccades are very fast. And yeah. so it's it's hard to be able to get a full theta cycle. And I mean, it's basically, I think, physically impossible to get that into that cycle. So they're just operating on different speeds. Yeah, another question from uh, Tim McMara, which uh, um, I'm also wondering about is uh, my impression from talks yesterday is that pure place cells are unusual in primates. Uh, it's more place plus view, or some people say mixed selectivity or conjunctive cells. Uh, is this uh, accurate summary, and is this true uh, of Morissette? So that would be almost true. In yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I think <laughs> given I think, your, um, the beginning of right. your talk, right? So yeah, I think it's probably mostly that the the sort of classic play cells have been explored. People haven't untethered their animals and done the freely moving, right? So I think whether or not how these whether or not classic play cells exist in isolation from vision. We just, we just, you know, there are only a couple studies that even look at classic place cells. And part of that is historical, you know, with the sort of preparations that people have used for primates. So now I think as more people, even in macaques, are sort of going to fairly moving preps, we'll hopefully have a better idea of whether or not that, you know, I guess in the way that I think about it, it just hasn't been reported. It doesn't mean that it's absent. And so, you know, our study and others, I think, have, are suggestive of that. Um, but yeah, that interact your study was in an alley, so you had some direction selectivity, so they would suggest mm -hmm. it. But uh, and you had some place, some of your cells were pure place cells because uh, they were not direction selective, except you right. didn't have all directions. So. Yeah, yeah. So in that one, we didn't do an open field. Um, so we, we kind of skipped over that to go to the 3D. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just a matter of, of getting that done and asking that question. Um, from the 3D, it seemed like the ones that we have seen, they can, you know, it's not really a 3D because it's, it's attached to a substrate. So they seem to be able to move through that in any direction and it fires. But I think we just have to kind of do the easier version, just let the monkeys run around on an open floor um, and then we'll have a better idea for that. Okay. Uh, 
Did you notice excursion-like behavior from the home base at the top of the environment? A foraging path followed by a direct path from the home base. You mean, so is this from the field study, I guess? Uh, no, no, it's directed to you, but uh, so that would be an uh, analysis of the uh, path that the animals take from their home base. So I suppose that they have uh, an outbound from their privileged position in your 3D. Yeah, uh, so there it's not in the home colony. So there's a separate testing room. So there isn't necessarily a home base there. Usually what they do is they kind of go to the highest point and that's where they hang out so if that's what you mean by home base um they they do tend to find follow sort of a traditional they kind of come up with a loop that they like to do through it um that becomes not stereotype because they it's not all the time but they do seem to have a preferred route through that environment um so we, you know we, we we kind of shelved those experiments for now because we wanted to get the eye tracking um in okay so we don't have a large data set for that just yet yeah uh, I just have a, I mean, there's a question from uh, Dan Mao, which uh, I think is uh, the first author of that uh, angelic uh, paper that came out. So it looks like uh, the Marmoset hippocampus contains much lower fraction of place cells, uh, place life cells than rodents. And the place fields are not as sharp, isolated as in rodents. So it seems to me uh, maybe we should look for more differences across species. Uh, for example, 3D head plus eye tracking and 3D moving is really useful. Uh, I would add to that that also maybe the size of the place that uh, um, cells are being recorded from might be, uh, uh, you know, because in large spaces, uh, place cells actually also have multiple fields. So that might be something. Uh, but you can say yeah. what you think about that. I mean, I, I think the percentages are, are hard to know exactly. So I think the what really has to be done to know if they line up is more labs doing this, not just us, and um, recording explicitly from the different subfields. So, you know, ours was sort of aggregating across everything. And so what it may be is that if we were in, you know, the right spot in CA1 or CA3, we might see a higher density of the cells. Um, so that that remains to be done. I've actually been trying to find a postdoc to do that for like two years now. And, and everyone that joins my lab wants to work on the social side. So if anyone wants to do that in a marmoset and you're looking for a postdoc, let me know, because that's, that's an experiment we basically do tomorrow. Um, so, but yeah, I think I think it's a sampling thing. We just need more data sets for more animals and and more species to really be able to say that. Because, um, like we all know, with extracellular physiology, it's sort of you know a stamp collecting kind of thing. So, you know, you you don't unless you're in a very particular place, it, you don't know whether or not you're sampling accurately. And, and so yeah, forth, that's so. true. And you might be selecting cells yeah. that are specifically mm -hmm. active, um, or yeah. So, the last question, because um, we have to move on, and we're a bit late. Have you assessed whether there is a prominent eta or slow theta delta activity related to these uh, activities? these cells uh so we we have seen we have a little bit i think um we ne we didn't see anything when they were locomotor lo locomoting in the first study to, to really kind of um make much of it not consistently um we are seeing in the head restrained um uh preparation a lot more uh uh oscillatory activity in different frequency bands. And, and some of that seems to be task related. Some of that seems to be um, related to what the animals are actually sort of engaged in at that moment. And so now I, I think those are really good questions. We, we have some really interesting effects uh, that um, we're pulling out, but we don't quite have our brains wrapped around it just yet. So again, hopefully in another month or two, we'll have that story a little bit better together and I can, I can tell you okay. about that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for uh, the great yeah. presentation. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, we'll now take a short break of uh, about 20 minutes, and uh, we'll start with the next session, which is uh, on the environment and uh, self motion. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for the great session. <laughs>